Welcome to Hard and Trocken. In this video, I want to give you a short introduction to the topic of logic. In mathematics and also outside mathematics, logic is all about statements and the decision if they are true or false. In logic, the underlying idea is that the decision if a given statement is true or false can always be obtained as the result of a sequence of logical steps starting at some obviously true statement. This is the principle of a mathematical proof. But let's start at the beginning and introduce some definitions. A statement or proposition is a meaningful declarative sentence that is either true or false. In logical notation, such statements are typically denoted by capital letters like A, B, C and so on. An example that is very often used in the literature is the sentence, the sun is shining. Obviously, this sentence can either be true or false. The truth of this statement obviously depends on the weather conditions. However, there are other types of statements, typically those referring to mathematical facts, whose truth or falsity never changes. One example might be, the square root of two is not a rational number which can be proven to be a false statement. As I said before, logic is all about figuring out if a given statement is true or false and providing structured, sometimes even mechanical methods to achieve this goal. Sometimes it is useful not to look at final statements about say a given number or the sun but to leave the object or the number the statement is talking about open to some flexibility. For this purpose, variables are used within the sentences. A variable is a symbol that may later be replaced with some expression. Variables are typically denoted by lowercase letters, a, b, c and so on. A sentence containing at least one variable is called open sentence or propositional function. An example is B is a divisor of 16. As long as we don't have any more information about the value of B, we can't decide whether the sentence is true or false. For instance, if B equals 4, the sentence is true. However, if B equals 3, the sentence is false. In particular, this example is not a statement because it can be both true or false depending on the value of b. There is, however, an easy way to turn an open sentence into a statement by using a process called quantification. Quantification means that an open sentence containing a variable is replaced by the statement saying for all possible values of the variable the open sentence containing the variable holds. A quick way to write this down is by using the so-called universal quantifier, which looks like an inverted capital A and is read like for all x. And there is a second way to quantify an open sentence. It is by saying there exists at least one value of the variable such that the sentence containing the variable is true. The way to quickly write this is the so-called existential quantifier, which looks like a capital E flipped around horizontally. It is to be read as there exists at least one x. Now let's have a look at some examples. Let's start by looking at some sentences and by trying to decide if they are statements or not. It is not always immediately clear if a sentence is a statement or not. A good way to check that is to test if we can decide if it's true or false. Let's check the first one. Socrates is a man. Considering all historical knowledge we have about Socrates, including the question of his existence, we know that he was a man. So yes, that sentence is true and in particular it is a statement. A triangle has three sides. Well, this sentence talks about mathematics. And that is one good thing about talking about mathematics. In most cases, things are either true or false. There are no different positions, opinions, political correctness and all these 
things. So yes, this is a true statement because, well, that is the very definition of a triangle, having three sides. Next one. Madrid is the capital of Spain. Well, even though this is no mathematical statement, we can still be quite sure about its truthfulness, let's say at least in the beginning of the 21st century. So yes, that's a true statement. Next, please. Who are you? Well, that is a sentence, but it's a question sentence. Being a question, we can't decide if it's true or false. So that, apparently, is not even a statement. Let's look at the next one. Run. Well, that is an order, an imperative. So again, that is no statement which can be false or true. Now that is a very lyrical one. Greenness perambulates. That sentence can be considered as a lyrical description of some landscape or something or some mood, but it's no statement where we can decide if it's really true or false. Similarly, a sentence which is pure verbal nonsense is of course no statement either, like this one. Now what about number 8? The King of France is wise. That indeed looks very much like a statement, because we could argue, well, the King of France is either wise or not wise. Depending on that, the statement is true or not true. However, the attribute of being wise is open to much interpretation. Depending on how an observer defines to be wise, that can be true for one observer and false for the other one. So again, that is no statement. Now let's have a look at some examples involving the two quantifiers, the universal quantifier and the existential quantifier. Let's start with a natural language version of the statement and then try to translate it into mathematical terms. Every man loves a woman. Well, the obvious all-day meaning of this sentence is that for all men in this world there is at least one woman such that the man loves this woman. Phrasing this a little more mathematically, using the universal and the existential quantifier, gives us this statement. For every man x in this world, which can be written simply as universal quantifier, man x, there exists at least one woman, let's call her y, we use the existential quantifier, there exists at least one woman y such that we can use such that, this um, abbreviation, such that the man loves the woman. That means X loves Y. Now we have, for every man X on this planet, there exists a woman Y, such that the man loves the woman. Now the question is, if we did a good job in translating the original sentence into these mathematical terms. Ignoring the fact that we might have reduced the romantic connotation, I want to tell you that we have indeed made it more precise. What do I mean by saying that? Well, the reason is that even though that new mathematical sentence still has the same logical meaning, it actually says a bit more. I want to demonstrate this to you by showing you another interpretation which can also be read from the original sentence. That second interpretation is a little absurd and I guess it's not the first one which comes into mind when we read the original sentence. That shows that our mind and our ability to read from the context is quite good in sharpening the meaning whenever natural language does not provide precise information. Now which alternative interpretation do I mean? Well, we could read it like this. There exists at least one woman y such that every man x on this planet loves this woman. So what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that there is one or even more than one special woman in this world who every man on this planet is in love with. Even though this might be true in case of some supermodel or actress or singer or whatever, it is not the immediate interpretation which comes to mind when looking at the original sentence. Anyhow, it is a possible interpretation. And that demonstrates that natural language very often is ambiguous. That means can have more than one meaning. 
Usually, we even unconsciously decide which meaning is the right one by the context. However, in certain contexts, for instance, when setting up a contract, these ambiguities, or rather avoiding these ambiguities, get rather crucial. In logic, we can build new statements from existing statements by combining them. The truth or falsity of the new combined statement will depend on the truth or falsity of the existing statements. The first combination, which is rather a modification than a combination, is negation. Negation takes an existing statement A and turns it into not A, that means it's contrary. It is denoted with a little horizontal dash with a little edge in front of the original statement. The negation of a statement A is simply called not A. If A is the sun is shining, not A is the sun is not shining. The conjunction of two statements A and B is a new statement which is true if and only if A and B are true. It is simply called A and B and is denoted by putting a wedge symbol between A and B, which reminds of the letter A for AND. If A is x is greater than 3 and B is x is smaller than 5, then A and B is the statement that x lies between 3 and 5. The disjunction takes two existing statements A and B and combines them to a new statement, which is true if and only if one of the two or both of the original statements are true. It is denoted with the letter V, which can be seen as the first letter for the Latin word vel, which means or. The disjunction is simply read as A or B. If A is x is greater than 3, and if B is x is smaller than 5, then A or B is, well, every real number x. Because every real number x is either greater than 3, smaller than 5, or even both. A little harder to understand is the so-called implication. The implication takes two existing statements, A and B, and puts a little arrow in between them. That arrow is to be read as A implies B, or from A follows B. Now the implication as such is at the center of all logical reasoning and we all know what it means. However, what does it mean as a combination of logical statements? Being a combination of the logical statements A and B, A implies B is a logical statement itself. As I told you earlier, being a combination of two statements means that the truth or the falsity of this combination depends on the truth or falsity of A and B. That means, in turn, that a given combination of statements, like the implication, is completely defined and understood whenever we know if the combination is true or false given all possible combinations of truth and falsity of the original statements A and B. This can be easily documented using a so-called truth table, which is at the center of combining statements and which we will look at in a second. But first let's look at the last combination, the equivalence. The equivalence is denoted by a double arrow and is true if and only if both A and B are true or both A and B are false. So the combination of statements and what that really means is best understood when looking at so-called truth tables. Let's talk about truth tables in the next video. Thanks for watching.